today's message is so needed as we think about one way that God infuses us with His Spirit and fills us as we follow Him. It's an act of worship that sometimes is referred to as the Lord's Supper, but most often you'll hear to it referred to as communion. And communion is going to take center stage in Paul's letter to the Corinthian church. Now, why would we bother taking a whole Sunday to talk about this? Well, because this matters. And the Corinthians were getting it wrong. And the Apostle Paul is going to let them know that they're missing the mark. They're missing a resource of great spiritual power and encouragement in their lives. Now, I'm going to be honest. When I was a kid, communion was the most boring part of the service for me. There didn't seem to be a lot going on, and I didn't fully understand it. But the Bible is clear that communion can be a time of real spiritual renewal for for the follower of Jesus. I mean, God has given us an action to participate in that is laden with transformative power, and we do this every week. And yet, if you're brand new to the church, you may not fully understand it. And if you've been around for a while, there's a chance that it's become rote or stale to you. But what if God were able to help you make substantial change in your life just by appropriately participating in communion? Would you be up for that? Who wouldn't want that? Let's dive into the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And there can be no doubt the Apostle Paul wants us to understand why communion is so important and how we ought to approach it whenever we observe it. And here's the really cool thing about today's teaching time. We're going to be able to apply the teaching right away. We're going to spend some time talking about these verses from the Bible that center on communion, and then we're going to set aside some time to take communion. And I hope that those moments will be filled with meaning and a depth of sincerity that's transformative. We'll begin by looking at some interesting verses where the Apostle Paul points out a problem for the Corinthian believers, and then he points towards the solution. First, let's see the problem. He says, In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. Now, if you've been following this teaching series over the past several weeks, you'll remember that the church in Corinth had unity issues. The church was divided in its opinion on how to handle a number of situations. There were differing points of view that had caused division in the congregation. And the Apostle Paul, who's writing this letter under the guidance of God's Spirit, is saying, hey, your divisions are not good for the health of the church, and frankly, they're an embarrassment to the watching world. And not only were these a difference of opinion that causes kind of this emotional separation between people, he says that when they were gathered together as a church, the divisions were apparent. They were visible in the room. And here's the rub. One of the sources of their division was around something that's supposed to unite them. Isn't that ironic, don't you think? Here's what was happening. The church would gather weekly to worship, and they would participate in the Lord's Supper, communion. And somewhere along the way, someone must have suggested, hey, you know, we're all meeting here after work for worship and communion. Why don't we just share dinner together beforehand? Everybody pack your dinner, we'll eat together, and then we'll have communion. Scholars refer to this as the agape feast. Agape is one of the Greek words for love. So the church had introduced this practice called the love feast that would lead into a time of communion. Some of you are thinking, wait a second, they had church at night? Well, in those days, Sunday wasn't considered part of a weekend. It was the first day of the work week. The people worked and then they gathered afterwards for church. Do you ever wonder why so many churches in America meet at 11 a.m. on Sunday? Well, for the lion's share of our time as a country, we've been a rural and agricultural country. So if you grew up on the farm, you could get up, do your chores, get cleaned up, and make it to church by 11 a.m. So, for those of you watching this on Sunday, I hope you're done milking the cows. Well, in Corinth, it was a shipping community, a trade mecca, so the people worked their jobs, and at the end of the day, they headed to church for the agape feast and the celebration of communion. But soon after they started this practice, it quickly evolved into the rich people kind of eating and drinking among themselves and the less fortunate people not participating at all. And eventually, drunkenness kind of ensued. And the Apostle Paul says quite sarcastically, I have no praise for you. And notice what he says. Your meanings are doing more harm than good. Verse 20. So then when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat, 
For when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers, and as a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. You know, I know we don't like it, but sometimes we need rebuked. And we live in a culture that's all about positive reinforcement, and I get that. Don't get me wrong. The Bible has a lot to say about encouragement. But sometimes we need someone to look us in the eye and say, stop that. Long time ago, I mean, I was still an adult, but I've been an adult a long time. So a long time ago, I got so mad at something, I kicked a hole in the wall. Now, I could give you the reason that I was mad, and you probably would sympathize with me. But that's not the point. I exercised a major lack of control. And I was telling my friend Frank about what I'd done, and he looked at me with this look of incredulity, and he said, what were you thinking? And I needed that rebuke. The Bible makes no attempt at holding back here at the beginning, and that's because of the severity of this sin. They've taken something holy, something precious, something God intended to help us grow close to Him, and they've turned it into a frat house kegger. And it's not even the drunkenness that that he's primarily upset about here. It's the fact that when they were eating a meal, they didn't include everybody. And the Apostle Paul says, that is antithetical to every value in the church, and it's not in keeping with the core message of communion. By the way, here's the core message of communion. We all need a Savior, and we all have a Savior, and everyone is invited to His table. Whosoever will may come, He said. You see, friends, communion is about commonness, and our commonness is the thing that ought to shine brightest at the core of the church. I mean, let's think about this. There are a lot of ways that we're different from each other in the church, right? Think about our congregation, CCC. People have different economic realities. Some may feel like they're doing really well right now. Others may feel like they're not doing so great. They're struggling to make ends meet. We live in different kinds of houses. We drive different sorts of cars. We have people with different political opinions. Depending upon who's in the White House, you're either happy or you're sad about American society at the moment. We have different kinds of home life experiences. There are people here who thrive because of the homes they came from and others who forge ahead in spite of the home that they came from. There are divides in culture depending upon geography, urban or suburban or rural. Friends, the only thing Americans aren't divided about is whether or not we're divided. 90% agree that there are serious fundamental divisions in our culture. And the church exists in this divided culture. CCC exists asking people to unite asking people to treat every other contributing factor in their life as secondary to the one thing that unites every human in every country and every culture, and that's that we all need a Savior, and we all have a Savior, and we're all invited to His table. Every other idea lays secondary at the feet of Jesus. And so Paul admonishes the Corinthians. He says, you're doing more harm than good. Your gatherings are accentuating the things that divide you, namely your economics, and you're making a mockery of the one thing that ought to unite you, this commemorative symbol of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, communion. Now, he had spent 18 months establishing this church, but in the five or so years since he left them, they have allowed their fellowship dinner and worship service to turn into a drunken feast that excluded about half the people. I mean, talk about getting it wrong. And so he's defined the problem, and in the next paragraph, Paul is going to lay out the core of our faith, and he reminds people why communion needs to be honored. The solution is about getting the important things right. Verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, humans are interesting creatures. We are spiritual beings at the core, but we're also physical beings. Spiritually, we long for the knowledge of God, but often we're controlled by our physical passions. Our physical drives and hungers become the motivations in our lives. 
And I think that the Bible is reminding us here that when we participate in communion, we're not primarily meeting a physical need, right? I mean, you don't take communion because you're hungry. It exists not to sate your physical appetite. It exists to sate your spiritual appetite. Now, that is really kind of a cool thing to me, that this is how much God understands us, that he gives us a physical task, a physical action that's meant to fill us spiritually. Jesus said this in his most famous sermon, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. He told a woman drawing water from a well that he could give her living water so that she'd never thirst again. He once fed 4,000 people with some bread. He did this in a very miraculous way, but afterwards he told them, don't follow me because you want your bellies to be full, because you need to partake of me, and then you'll be spiritually full if you wanna have eternal life. You see, over and over again, Jesus reminded the people that while we're often led by our physical appetites, it's the spiritual appetite that needs fed the most. And that happens in communion. Now, how does that take place? Well, at least in a couple of ways. First of all, communion helps us to remember Jesus. Notice the Bible teaches very plainly here that the act of communion is commemorative. Jesus uses this phrase twice, in remembrance of me. And so we remember Jesus when we take communion, his perfect life, his perfect teaching. We remember the night that he was betrayed. Do you remember what he was doing that night? I mean, in addition to instituting communion, he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, I don't think I realized this until a few years ago, but the Garden of Gethsemane is really close to the city gate of Jerusalem, maybe a 10 minute walk. And I had always pictured Jesus kind of getting ambushed in the garden when he was betrayed by Judas. But the truth is, you can see the city gate really clearly, and you can see the path from the city gate all the way down to the grove of olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane. In other words, Jesus would have seen his betrayer coming, and he could have run, he could have escaped, but he stayed and he prayed for us. He willingly gave himself. Jesus was not a martyr captured by surprise. He was a lamb led to slaughter. He went willingly. We remember in communion that he died on a cross. The Bible records Jesus saying, this cup represents a new covenant in my blood. And this new covenant doesn't require the ongoing sacrifice of animals to God. It's a covenant sealed in the sacrifice of the Son of God, Jesus, on the cross who died once for all. And in this act of remembering, our soul is fed. It humbles us because we recognize that all the stuff that God's done for us, it fills us because we realize how much he loves us. So communion helps us to remember Jesus. We do it in remembrance of him, and that feeds our soul. But communion also forces us to examine ourselves. Notice these verses. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. Now, there's been a lot of talk through the years about what it means to take communion in an unworthy manner. And I wanna be really crystal clear about this. When it comes to individuals, nobody is ever worthy of God's love or forgiveness. I mean, we might shine up okay on the outside. We might put on our good clothes and look our best spiffy self sometimes, but we're not worthy of what Jesus did for us. That was a total act of grace, unearned favor from God. I think about my own life. So many times I've been thoughtless. I've said angry words that I couldn't take back. I've harbored a grudge. I've spoken ill of others. I simply am not good enough to earn what God has given freely. I'm unworthy. John Corson writes, on the basis of this passage, many think that they're unworthy to partake in communion if they're struggling with a certain sin or wrestling with a particular temptation. But the Lord's table is the very place for the person that's struggling with sin, wrestling with temptation, for it's there that he can say, Lord, I desperately need you in my life. The idea that they were unworthy is really the wrong thought here. It's the manner that they were observing communion that was unworthy. They were flipping about it. 
They treated it as if it had no meaning at all. At best, it was an empty ritual to them. At worst, it became kind of this fun house mirror image version of what God had intended. It was distorted and even shameful. In fact, it had gotten so bad that God began to punish some of the people in the church directly for their sacrilege. That's why he adds this verse that says, everyone ought to examine themselves. So in communion, I remember, I remember Jesus, all that he's done for me, but I also examine myself. Am I approaching this moment with the thoughtfulness and reverence that's equal to the gravity of what it represents? You know, it's pretty easy to slip into times in our worship where we just kind of go on autopilot. I mean, the rituals are familiar to us. Many of the songs are familiar. We can find ourselves just going through the motions. We're singing the words, but they're not really registering with us. We're present physically, but our minds are elsewhere. And let's be honest, it's so common to check our phones these days, right? It can be tough to go 55 minutes without doing it. And so the time that we set aside for God for worship isn't really fully set aside for Him because our heads and sometimes our hearts are elsewhere. And I think this is a really common danger for communion because we do it every week. It's a super familiar act for us to participate in, and we can go through it on autopilot without examining ourselves at all. And Paul says, you need to do this. You need to reflect. Let me tell you how I do this most of the time. I'm not saying that this is the right way or that this is the only way. I'm just saying this is how I've grown into this. Part of me examining myself starts with just taking a deep breath. And I change the channel of my mind. And I thank God for the sacrifice of Jesus. I don't spend so much time thinking necessarily about his physical suffering, though that does cross my mind. I think more about how great God is that he would provide a savior for me. And then I examine my life. What things do I know about that aren't lining up with God's instructions for me? Are there areas I know about where I've just kind of chosen to be selfish, chosen to live my own way? And in my mind's eye, I just try to lay those things down before God. And then I think, Lord, what are the areas where I've just kind of been oblivious to your desires for me? The saints of old used to classify these as sins of commission and sins of omission. Sins of commission were the ones that I intentionally commit, willingly. God says, don't gossip, I gossip. Sins of omission are sins of missed opportunity. I should have been loving, but I wasn't. I was too preoccupied. I should have shown, shown kindness, but I didn't. And again, I'm not saying that this is the way. I'm just saying that this is my way most weeks. And I just try to lay all that stuff down before God. Now think about this with me. If followers of Jesus were to do this on a regular basis, weekly in corporate worship, how would it affect our posture before God and each other if every week we remember Jesus and every week we examine ourselves. Now I'm gonna teach you a word, we don't use it much around here. You may have heard it. In many churches through the centuries, communion was actually called the Eucharist. Doesn't sound much like an English word. Well, it's not. It comes from the Greek word Eucharistia, which means thanksgiving. I, I like that. Where does our remembrance of Jesus, where does our examination of self take us? It takes us to a place of thanksgiving. When I think about my life and the worst parts of me, when I think I, of who I would be without Jesus in my life, when I think about how much God has loved me, it just makes me so grateful. It makes communion, for the most part, a time of celebration. In fact, the whole thing becomes food for my soul, spiritual nourishment. But you see, that takes a few minutes to get recentered. And I would encourage you, when communion time comes around, don't be in a rush to get your communion packet out. Take a breath, slow it down, remember Jesus, examine yourself, and then give thanks and allow your soul to be nourished. Now, there's one other important thing to think about out of these verses, and it's a phrase we've already read, verse 26. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. There's a part of observing communion that is proclamation. 
Now, under the Old Covenant, there was a special feast called Passover, and the Jewish believers celebrated it every year. In fact, they didn't just do it out of some kind of tradition. God told them to do it annually. It was a declaration of what God had done in bringing the people of Israel out of Egypt. So many times in the Old Testament, God would identify himself this way. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Passover as a feast was a proclamation to the world of what God had done for the Jewish people. Now in the coming of Jesus, there's a shift. The remembering and proclaiming was no longer going to be centered around God's work in Egypt. Jesus said he was establishing communion as a sign of the new covenant. It was to become a feast that would remind everyone of what Jesus was doing. Only it wouldn't be a yearly feast, it'd be a weekly proclamation. A proclamation that Jesus is Lord. In the book of Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul wrote, I am not ashamed of the gospel. You know, I think there's something about taking communion that's a declaration that, that kind of says that. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. In fact, I'm banking on the gospel. When we take communion, it's a symbol of faith. It's like repeating a creed without the words. It's a statement to yourself and anyone who sees you that you believe that Jesus' death brings forgiveness and that his resurrection brings eternal life. Because, you see, communion is a proclamation that Jesus is Lord. I wonder, when you take communion today, is there any area in your life where you need to proclaim, Jesus is Lord over this? because there's nothing too great for him. Don't you see, friends, when you take communion, you're saying again and again and again, week after week after week, I need a savior and I have a savior and he's overcome. You're proclaiming again and again and again that I share a commonness with everyone else in the church, that we're all sinful people whose only significant identifying characteristic is that we've been forgiven and now we belong to God and each other and nothing else matters. No other allegiance, no other philosophy or opinion. Our identity as his forgiven people is what matters. You know, a few verses earlier in 1 Corinthians, Paul says this, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there's one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. You see, there it is. We are one. Why? Because we all need participation in the sacrifice of Jesus. We all need the forgiveness of sin that comes through him. We all need that rightness with God. We all need the significance and security that only comes through being his children. And I think it's interesting that of all the spiritual significance that God wants us to grasp, that it takes place around basic items of food, bread and juice, that ultimately nourish us, not physically, but spiritually. When I was a kid, there was something about the dinner table that was pretty special in our family. We had special rules about how you conducted yourself around the table. There were probing questions from my father and mother. How was your day? What happened at school? Who'd you hang out with? My dad would share about his work and we'd learn all about that. But there was one thing that dad and mom never tolerated at the dinner table, and that was arguing. There was a family unity that was celebrated at our meals. And Paul says this, because there's one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. There's something about communion that reminds us we're all in this together, and our only hope is Jesus. Jesus. 